Shortly before one o'clock on Wednesday morning, an inferno broke out in a tower block in West London. Oh my God, they're screaming! At least 58 people were killed in the fire at Grenfell Tower. That number is expected to rise. That night witnessed scenes of unimaginable horror. It was quite high up, like just above the middle, and she was screaming, I've got a baby, please help me get out. I can't get out. I'm trapped. I need to save my baby. As well as those of astonishing bravery. As I was going down downstairs, you had firefighters going up the stairs. Brave firefighters going up the stairs. The Prime Minister has finally announced a full public inquiry, and today the Chancellor's shock revelation that the cladding around the building may have been banned. We need to know what happened. We need to know, have an explanation of this. We owe that to the families, to the people who have lost loved ones, friends, and the homes in which they lived. Now, with protests on the street at the government's response, there is growing evidence this tragedy is turning into a criminal and political scandal. These were the scenes in Britain's richest borough last Friday evening. An angry mob storming Kensington Town Hall, demanding answers. And an increasingly beleaguered Prime Minister chased out of the area with cries of murder ringing in the streets. The build-up to these extraordinary scenes started five days ago. At six minutes to one on the morning of Wednesday the 14th of June, the London Fire Brigade received a 999 call. It reported a fire had broken out in a block of flats in Latimer Road, West London. The emergency services arrived six minutes later. The flames were already beginning to spread. Residents were trapped on the upper floors. Okay, I don't, don't open it. the front door. You're going to bring the smoke in. Okay. Well, you're not going to be able to breathe. Your I'm children scared. are not going to be able someone to breathe. This footage is filmed by a woman who lived on one of the top floors of Grenfell Tower. Her name is Rania Ibrahim, a mother of two. Listen, you have your children. Okay. Standing near the door, the smoke is not going to help you. Okay. Yeah? Okay, just Where's this. your husband? Her front door is the only protection from the acrid smoke billowing along the corridors. Ooh. Hello, come here! Come here! Hello? Hello? Come, come, come! Quick, quick! Hello? Here, here, here! Come in, you gotta. No, because the smoke is coming. But the people don't. The footage was posted on Facebook at 1.40 a.m. Oh, my God, I closed it. I closed it. As the emergency services arrived, they started communicating by loudspeaker. She says, the police are telling us to get out. The whole building is on fire and we're on the floor above. How are we going to get out? We're stuck on the 23rd floor! Hello! There's too many people stuck upstairs! Rania and her two children are among those who are officially listed as missing. Hello! Within 20 minutes of the alarm being raised, 40 fire engines arrived at the Lancaster West estate. 
But the firefighters were already facing an impossible task. Their ladders and hoses could only reach the 12th floor. In less than 20 minutes, the inferno was blazing on all 23 storeys. That's water, yeah? Yeah, it's water, it's water. Residents and neighbours below could only watch and listen, powerless to help. Oh my God, they're screaming! Oh my God. Some residents on the lower floors managed to escape. One eyewitness claimed he knew how the fire started. It's by chance that we had a knock and the guy who knocked so happens to be the guy whose house was the cause of the whole thing. This is fridge. He explained to us as he came down afterwards and was outside the building, he explained to us that it was due to his fridge which exploded. That's what he kept saying. Floor. On the fourth floor in house number 16. And well, do you think everyone inside the block I has been evacuated? No. No. How do you know? How do we know? Because the fire spread extremely quick. And people on the left-hand side of the building were screaming out, help us, sticking their heads out of the window. People were waving phones for, you know, for invisibility because there's so much smoke coming around right now. As the fire continued to rage, more eyewitnesses came forward. I mean, I live about a five-minute walk away and we could hear people screaming, help me, help me, and flashing their phone lights to let people know that they were there. It's just, it's, it's just helpless. We've just, just been asked to bring up water to the, the people that have come out to the, the sports centre. There's a sports centre around there, and we just they let us through the cordons to bring up loads of bottles of water. The enormity of the tragedy meant more than a hundred extra police officers were quickly drafted in. Anybody who you're speaking to in the building, they need to ring 999. There is a dedicated line for this incident. Okay. Thank you. And more than 20 ambulance crews raced to the tower to treat casualties and ferry the seriously injured to nearby hospitals. By first light the next morning, there was little doubt this was one of Britain's worst fires in modern times. A 23-storey residential block with 124 homes, now little more than a blackened, smouldering shell. Gradually, the survivors of Grenfell Tower, terrified and exhausted, emerged to tell their horrific stories. I wasn't woken up by the alarms at all. They were very, very quiet alarms. I was in bed, I was on the verge of falling asleep, and I smelled plastic. I've got up, I've looked around the flat, checked the plugs, everything was OK. I went to the kitchen to smoke a cigarette. I've opened the window, and I heard some woman saying, it's getting bigger, it's getting bigger. So I've gone out to the hallway, I've looked through the spy hole, I see smoke everywhere, I've opened the door, and the neighbours were there, the people screaming, the firemen said, get down the stairs. So I grabbed the little girl, grabbed my girlfriend, ran out of the house. I heard a lot of screams and I could see, after I got outside, I was looking up and I could see people banging on the windows and there was fire all around them, it was horrendous. There was a lot of people on the upper floors flashing their torchlights and the most upsetting thing about it all was you could, you could make out there was a couple of young kids with flashlights waving at um, people to try and help them. You could hear a lot of screaming saying, help me, please, please, please. And it's just really emotional and sad to hear. We saw people from the 14th floor crying. Uh, people from the 16th floor, my neighbor, his son was struggling. I told him, where is your dad? Because I know his dad. And he said to me, he's indoors, he can't walk. I said to him, let's go in. When we even try to get in, the smoke is nowhere you can get. Me, I was going through the, the floor, the fire brigade, we had their uh, oxygen. We never had the oxygen, so I just have to leave.
Yet for all the tales of horror at Grenfell Tower, there was still praise for the remarkable courage of the emergency services. As I was going downstairs, you had brave firefighters going up the stairs, putting their BA sets on, basically going up, trying to get rescue as many people as they possibly did. As they were going up, I did ask them if you want me to knock on people's doors to try and help in any way which I possibly could. They just said to me, for your own safety, just get out, get out, get out the building. And later, heart-wrenching testimony from the firefighters themselves. We had a little boy who came downstairs with, a, with his mother who was in a very bad way, probably about five years old, and we asked, is there anyone else in that flat? And he's turned around, he's looked at me, he says, my brother, but he's dead. That whole building was completely engulfed in flame. We were all inside that building. And a lot of times the crews, that, the ones that were there initially and the crews ahead of me were upstairs going into floors without any water simply just looking around and just try, trying to do their best, banging on doors and kicking in doors and trying to get people out. In the first of many news conferences that day, the most senior fire officer in London confirmed the enormity of the disaster. This is an unprecedented incident. In my 29 years of being a firefighter, I have never, ever seen anything of this scale. Our first fire engines were on scene in under six minutes. Crews wearing breathing apparatus and extended duration breathing apparatus have been working in extremely challenging and very difficult conditions to rescue people and to bring this major fire under control. At this time, I am very sad to confirm that there have been a number of fatalities. Officially, there were now multiple deaths and that meant many questions. How come a fire that appears to have started in a fourth floor flat had engulfed an entire building in less than 20 minutes? In the early hours of Wednesday morning, a fire which residents say started in the fourth floor flat of Grenfell Tower in West London had destroyed the entire building. That whole block is gone. People, children. The whole block is gone. The flames had spread through the structure, creating an inferno that was impossible for the emergency services to tackle. Oh my God, they're screaming. Eyewitnesses to the tragedy spoke of unimaginable horror. There's people rolling down sheets and trying to make ropes to, to get down. Obviously, they must have been trapped and they couldn't get out. And there was banging on the windows, screaming, flashing lights to try and get their attention. There was the fire brigade trying to put ladders up at different, kite, different parts of the building. She was quite high up, like just above the middle, and she was screaming, I've got a baby, please help me get out. I can't get out. I'm trapped. I need to save my baby. I did see a few people jump, people were jumping. Um, I think at that point it was, you either jump in uh, trying to save your life, you might break a few bones or get engulfed in that flame. I saw two people jump from the right hand side, from, I think they were either floor from 10 to 15, I couldn't tell you which floor. I couldn't tell you if they were adults, I couldn't tell you if they were kids or teenagers. All I could see is two people flinging themselves off the thing. People were telling me, other people are doing it on the other on the other side as well. There's just one staircase, one in, one out. So if you can't get to them staircase, you are not getting out of that building. There's only one way out of that building, and that's the jump. Throughout the morning, the London Fire Brigade continued to tackle the blaze. Although the chances of finding any survivors were receding, there were glimmers of hope. A man is seen standing to the left of the picture, peering out of his flat, while three storeys above the building burns. We don't know his fate. At the same time, anxious relatives spoke of their desperate calls to loved ones in the tower. 10, 15 minutes later, we phoned them back, and I said, where is your husband? She said, he's still talking, and they said, they're coming to us. And I said, what happened? She said, the last thing she said, smoke is coming heavily through the door into the flat. 
and that was the last time we, we, we heard of him. I pray to God that they're okay. Um, the fire did go and spread to that part of the building, their parts of the building, and I know that they, I was told from people who had managed to contact them that they had moved to the flats next door, but um, I've, we've asked around. I know people, the services and the authorities here are still trying to gather information. We've gone to several of the uh, rescue centers that have been set up and asked and given names, but we've had nothing so far. I know it takes a while. I'm just praying to God that they're all right. With so much confusion surrounding the fate of those in the building, relatives of the missing began to organize their own searches. Karim Mazili began to look for his uncle. He'd last heard from Hesham Rahman at 3 a.m. on the day of the fire. Oh, we'll see something. If you see them there, please get in contact with myself so I can call them the family. Okay, thank, thank you. So I'm sorry as well. With little information to go on, Karim did everything he possibly could to find his uncle, including stopping passing strangers. Yeah, I can do that for you. Can, can I go there? Because we, go we can't go in there. I can do that. Would you be able to please. put it up well, somewhere? Yeah, Karim, I can ask knows. them to hand them out. Would please, that be okay? Give it to the reception. She knows the family. Of course. She thank does. You thank you very much. much. Thank you. They're not letting anybody in the hospital. As he walked the streets, he helped coordinate the efforts of other family members as they too searched the hospitals. So uncle basically said that he's gone to um, uh, Chelsea Muslim Minister Hospital. He's been in there. They've identified all of the people that have come from the Grenfell Towers and my uncle wasn't one of them. So he's now making his way to the next hospital. He said St Mary's Hospital. So he's gonna go there next and, and uh, see what happens. Although he spent the rest of the day looking, Kareem's desperate search was fruitless. As news of the disaster spread, donations began to pour in from all over the capital. Food, water, clothing, everyday items we all take for granted had now become essentials for those who'd lost everything in the fire. It was a heartening display of solidarity from Londoners of every race, creed, class and colour. Well, why have you decided to come all the way across London I mean, to help people out, presumably, you've never met? To be, to be honest, it's Ramadan right now, so it's like the month of giving to people and stuff. And since now this happened, so I thought it was like a good thing to do, to help people out, basically. What's in your bag? Do you mind us having no, a quick I've look? Just got, they told us just to label it. I've got baby and toddler's clothes. I've got some, some towels and baby baby grows and things like that. And, um, and Star Doodle to fly. And did this stuff belong to...? Yeah, it was all junior stuff. Yeah, Stella's thing, things and, and her older brothers and sisters. So it's a good time to get it out, isn't it, really, for today? You know, I could have been them. could have been me. could have been any of us. But I think it's, you know, my sense was we're Londoners. We help one another out. After all the events that have gone on, Westminster Bridge, Borough, we're Londoners, we've got to pull together. But while the rest of London was showing its generosity, back at the scene of the fire, many wanted to know why. Witnesses spoke about the instructions issued to residents to stay put in their flats and wait for rescue. I said, where is your husband? She said, he's talking to the emergency. And I said, why didn't you come out? She said, they tell us to stay in. We cannot come out. And uh, I said, what did they ask you to do? She said, they asked us to cover the, the doors. So there were firefighters inside the building evacuating they people. They just came in, trying to evacuate the people, telling them to go. But they told us to stay in, but I have to open the door and to get out. Other survivors spoke of fire alarms that failed to go off. I walked down, I found the fire brigade man, he's coming to the stairs. I used the stairs to go down to see what happened exactly in the building. And when I asked, we asked him, he said, there is fire on the fourth floor, one of the houses on the fourth floor. The time I ran out just to get my kids and clo I closed my door because it was too much smoke. Just I get my kids and go out. But the problem is there is no fire alarms running, working. I don't know why the fire brigade, he didn't break the glass to, to, to tell the people to go out until when people have been dying there. And others pointed to the new cladding that surrounded the building. 
It seemed to be a factor in the rapid acceleration of the flames that engulfed the tower block. I just watched that fire climb up the left-hand side of the building uh, like as if it was crawling up on, like as if it was paper. The way it, 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 it flew up, it was, it, was, it, was, it was terrifying. And then I realised it was the panelling the panelling that they had been stuck, they'd been put in, in the last bit of work that they did, it was the panelling they put on the outside to make the estate look good. At a news conference 12 hours after the fire had started, the emergency services insisted it was too early to reach any conclusions. This will, of course, be subject to a major investigation, but at this moment in time, we do not wish to speculate further about the cause of the fire or the fire spread that is something that will be closely looked at in the very near future. But for the Mayor of London, the first politician to visit the scene of the catastrophe, there was the early recognition that the tragedy had the making of a serious scandal. There are genuine concerns, reasonable concerns that have been raised during the course of the night and it's really important that these questions are answered. I'll be demanding answers and I can reassure you that I'll be ensuring that we have independence in relation to the reassurance we need. We also need to make sure that lessons are learned, but also if, and this is a big if, and Danny's right to warn us of the importance of not jumping to conclusions, if there are you know, uh, mistakes made, we want to make sure we learn them. The fire and the response to it was rapidly becoming a pressing political issue. An hour later, Jeremy Corbyn, a lifelong campaigner on poor quality local housing and safety issues, insisted he too would be looking for answers. When you start asking questions, uh, is that going to include people who work closely with the Prime Minister? It must include those that have been ministers in the previous government before the general election uh, and maybe are not ministers at the present time because they had their hand on the tiller at that time. We need to know what reports are available, what information was given and what actions were taken. These are the kind of searching questions we must ask tomorrow, today, save lives. Theresa May spent much of the day behind closed doors in cross-government meetings to coordinate the response. At 8.20 that evening, she made her first public statement. Once the scene is secure, once uh, the recovery is complete, then an investigation will take place into the cause of the fire and if there are any lessons to be learned. But until then, our focus must be on ensuring that the emergency services have what they need to continue with their harrowing work and that help and support is being provided to all those who have suffered as a result of this tragedy. For many, it was not enough. The failure at that stage to call for a full public inquiry meant she'd misjudged the mood of the nation. And it was becoming clear the fire had the potential to cause her already fragile administration yet more damage. Mr Corbyn and other Labour MPs have uh, challenged the government on uh, statements made by Gavin Barwell. Now, by coincidence, he's the new chief of staff here, but he was the housing minister until he lost his seat last Thursday. He, last year in Parliament, promised new fire safety regulations and Labour have been claiming uh, that those haven't been brought in. That was in response to uh, a fire in South East London, actually in the constituency of Harriet Harman. Uh, and so there is some political uh, controversy over this uh, dre dreadful tragedy. As the last flames were extinguished, the political controversy had well and truly been ignited. The victims, their families and the neighbourhood became increasingly angry. How do you feel when you look at that building now? What do you mean, how do I feel? How do you feel? Look at, when you can look at that building, you can tell me how you feel and times that by a thousand. Do you know what I mean? It's, people, it's not just looking at the building and saying, how do I feel? It's looking at the building and knowing that I know people who died in that building. Everyone, every resident, every person who, who can call himself a part of this community of Notting Hill would have at least known one person in that building.
At around 1 a.m. on the morning of Wednesday the 14th of June, a fire tore through Grenfell Tower in West London. But tonight there are 58 deaths and it's a death toll which is expected to rise. 36 hours after the tragedy, the Prime Minister upgraded her initial announcement of an investigation to a full-scale public inquiry. Right now, people are, want answers, and it's absolutely right. And that's why I am today ordering a full public inquiry into this disaster. We need to know what happened. We need to know, have an explanation of this. We owe that to the families, to the people who have lost loved ones, friends, and the homes in which they lived. And the Metropolitan Police have now launched a criminal investigation into the cause of the fire. So how is it that the 23-storey building could be engulfed in flames so quickly with such a huge loss of life? Grenfell Tower was built in 1974 as part of the great construction boom carried out by local authorities to house low-income families. In 2002, the council passed responsibility for the refurbishment of the tower block to a private, not-for-profit company, the Kensington and Chelsea Tenant Management Organisation. But for years, the relationship between the organisation and the tenants was poor, and the questions over fire safety were constantly raised. In 2013, there was a massive power surge in the block which knocked out all the electrical devices in people's homes uh, up to about the 10th floor. That was when they first started raising concerns about the safety of the building, what would happen if there was a major fire. And they were told that the fire brigade had inspected it and it was no problem, and if there was a small fire, that, you know, this uh, go into your flat and stay policy would apply and they would be perfectly safe for about an hour. In 2014, the local authority embarked on a series of renovations across the borough, including Grenfell Tower. The Kensington and Chelsea Tenant Management Organisation contracted work to a company called Ryden Maintenance Limited, who received £8.6 million for the refurbishment. Another contractor was the East Sussex-based Harley Facades, who provided the rain screen overclad and replacement windows for the building, a contract worth £2.6 million. And Wit UK, based in Halifax, was contracted to work on the smoke ventilation system. During the refurbishment project, there were a lot of problems came up and residents raised them with the TMO and with the council. I raised them. I. I sent 19... What sort of concerns? There were major concerns just about the way the project was being handled. In the months leading up to the blaze, a tenants' association, the Grenfell Action Group, also asked questions about fire safety. In a blog in November 2016, they stated that only a catastrophic event will expose the ineptitude and incompetence of our landlord. And in March 2017, we are on record as stating that it's our belief that a serious and catastrophic incident will be the undoing of this mini-mafia. On the Wednesday evening after the fire, we asked the head of the management group about the list of concerns. We do listen to uh, residents. I've got eight residents on my board who are very concerned about these things and we address them in, and, and get to the bottom of it. Uh, I can't really comment what other councillors are saying at the moment. Along with the police and the fire brigade, we're, we're just trying to work out, resolve where we are at the moment and then we'll all contribute to the investigation to find out the causes rather than respond to what people say. And put the tenants' grievances to the head of the council. I understand the anger. Um, I'm angry. This has been the most devastating fire I think anybody can, uh, can remember. Um, it was the most appalling tragedy. But the renovation of a tower will always be based on the advice, the regulatory standards, the requirements uh, to build in uh, fire safety. And there will need to be a thorough investigation as to whether um, this refurbishment met those standards. 
We also paid a visit to the headquarters of the contractors, the Ryden Group, and asked for an interview. We spoke on the phone uh, and we're told we can speak with the director, okay. someone like that. We're not available for interviews at the moment, we have a press statement. That statement read, Ryden Maintenance Limited completed a partial refurbishment of the building in the summer of 2016 for KCTMO on behalf of the council, which met all required building regulations, as well as fire regulation and health and safety standards. And handover took place when the completion notice was issued by Royal Borough of Kensington and Chelsea Building Control. In light of the public inquiry, we cannot make any further comment at this time. So, what of the cladding provided by the subcontractors that many eyewitnesses claimed was responsible for the spread of the fire? Sky News obtained cladding made from the same source as that found at Grenfell Tower. It consists of aluminium layers sandwiching polyethylene insulation in the middle. We took the material to a safety testing lab capable of generating the intense heat that was found in the fire. After two minutes, the aluminium buckles under the heat and the insulation is exposed. It now becomes fuel for the fire. Exposed to this sort of heat level, uh, it is eventually going to start to uh, separate the various layers and um, uh, it is burning. There's yeah. no, obviously, there's no way of getting around the fact. So the cladding looks like one explanation for the rapid spread of the flames. Tower blocks are constructed to be compartmentalised. If a fire breaks out in a kitchen, for example, fire doors should keep that blaze within a flat. Elements like the lift shaft are also fireproofed and isolated to stop fires spreading. So is the fire escape. The emphasis is on giving people enough time to escape while the fire burns. Cladding, though, can bypass those features by its highly flammable insulation which can then travel between floors. And it can also contain cavities, either by design or the fire damaging the exterior. If the flame gets in here, it will shoot up as it gets oxygen, extending up to five or ten times its length. That means it can skip up floors. If the windows are open on the floor above, as many would have been on a hot London night, the flame can spread back into the building on another floor. In 2000, a parliamentary inquiry into cladding and fire safety had made a number of recommendations. Many of these had been included in an industry report published 18 months before the blaze, including, we do not believe that it should take a serious fire in which many people are killed before all reasonable steps are taken towards minimizing the risks. Residents we spoke to insist they raised the report with the Tenants Management Organisation and say their warnings were ignored. Things like that, when it happens, you know, if you ignore it, something bigger will happen, and it happened. They've known now for over two years. That's even that documented on, on the internet. You know, they knew about wiring and faulty things. Even my friends have complained. And, uh, you know, it's like they tell you they're going to sort it, but nothing ever happened. And this morning, the shock revelation from Chancellor Philip Hammond that the cladding may well have been banned here in the UK. Confusion about fire safety regulation and missed warnings. No wonder there's growing anger towards authority. The young kid, the young kid. Yeah, hello, uh, what's your name? Can I shake your hand? How many children died? What are you going to do about it? The child's anger was directed towards the London Mayor, Sadiq Khan, in one of his many visits to the site following the tragedy. There are very brave firefighters and police and ambulance workers. And um, once it's safe, then they're going to go into the building. What are you going to do about it? Yeah. Yeah. That, that's what they're doing, you see. They're going through the building now. And that's why it takes some time. And I know, I know it's very sad because you may have a friend in there. So what are you going to do with people's life? They lost their home. Well, that's, that, that's why it's important. No, no. That we need to make sure that they have somewhere to live. I can't hear you. That's why we need to make sure somewhere to live. And look, we're going, we're, going, we're, we're going to do that. We're going to do that. I know it's upsetting. I know you're angry. We'll get those answers. And within 24 hours, the sense that no one was listening would lead to furious protests breaking out across London.
By Friday morning, the blaze at Grenfell Tower had finally been extinguished. But the mood in the streets around the ruined tower block was one of growing anger at the Prime Minister. What is Theresa May scared of? Why aren't she down here comforting people? Yeah, you went and saw some firemen and they're talking about security risks. Security risks, she's a disgrace. They put all the black people and all the poor people in the towers and this has happened. The government, by now conscious that they had been slow to respond to the public mood, dispatched their senior politicians. But the reception for the leader of the House of Commons was one of barely contained fury. Enough is enough. I've got friends in that tower. I have a right to be angry. I've got friends in there. Because of people saving money, people are dying. Yeah, well, you know, that, that's why it will be so important to get to the bottom of what happened. That's going to take too long, though, isn't it, Miss Ludson? It's just going to take far too long for people here. We're on the verge, we're on the verge of some serious anger in the streets. Yeah. No, I, and I, am, I absolutely understand it. I can see it. And I'm deeply, deeply sorry on behalf of all of my colleagues in the House of Commons sending our greatest sympathy. In contrast, the reception for Her Majesty the Queen and Prince William was one of respect and gratitude when they visited the survivors. Her Majesty met the victims and listened as they shared with her tales of trauma and suffering. It's terrible, terrible, the voices of the children. They didn't shift. No, they just come in. It's interesting, I think come over very strongly. Because the community's been to help. Echoing through the hall, the uncontrollable wailing of a woman whose anguish expressed the feelings of all those who survived. Prince William, himself the veteran of many rescue operations, spoke of the trauma suffered by those caught up in such terrible circumstances. I hope that being a tough is not it's really important. You know, it's all about carrying the momentum fine. It doesn't help, but in the long run, that's one of the most terrifying things I've ever seen. As they left, an explanation that they had to go, but a promise they would return. But later that afternoon, hundreds of protesters took to the streets of West London. For many, the fire had become a potent symbol of everything that was wrong with the way they were governed. And now they were demanding answers. They asked for more support for the living and for more details about their dead. Everyone wants answers here. We don't know how many people have still been unaccounted for. We, we, we need answers. We need to know when things are going to happen. We want to know when people are going to be put housing. We need answers now. And then this. Angry citizens breaking into the town hall of the wealthiest borough in Britain. The police were called to clear the building while some protesters implored the rest to leave. It was a show of anger and defiance that continued after the building had been cleared. The public inquiry that has been promised by the Prime Minister is going to be appointed by, and led and appointed by somebody who the Prime Minister appoints. We believe that is not impartial. There must be an independent inquiry and inquest into what led to this gross tragedy that the people of London had to suffer. The scuffles and clashes with security guards eventually ended, but it was a sign of the volatility in the area. Something the Prime Minister was to witness at first hand when she paid a visit on Friday evening. As she made her way to St Clement's Church, one of the relief centres, an angry crowd surrounded her car and shouted out, shame on you. 
Later that evening, the Prime Minister revealed that she was committed to supporting the victims with more money. I think we were all, when we saw the horrific scenes of what had happened at Grenfell Tower, we all were deeply affected by that. It's absolutely horrifying. And I've been hearing stories today from people about their experiences. I've also been hearing from the local community about the issues and concerns that they have. Now, the government is making £5 million available for uh, those emergency funds for people who need uh, just to get money to be able to buy the normal things of everyday life. Many believe the £5 million is too little, too late. And the Prime Minister herself has admitted the support for families was not good enough. And the political pressure on her and her administration continues. Among the many accusations levelled against the government, the most damning is that it failed on a series of clear warnings to improve fire safety in tower blocks. In July 2009, a serious fire broke out in the Lackanall House, a 14-storey tower block in Camberwell, South East London. This is a very serious fire, one of the most serious that I've attended, certainly in terms of the number of uh, casualties and injuries and uh, tragically fatalities at this incident. Six people were killed, 20 seriously injured. The assistant deputy coroner investigating the blaze wrote to the Department of Communities and Local Government in 2013. It is recommended that your department encourage providers of housing in high-rise residential buildings containing multiple domestic premises to consider the retrofitting of sprinkler systems. And in April 2010, yet another serious fire in a tower block in Southampton. This blaze at Shirley Towers saw two firefighters lose their lives. Once again, the coroner investigating wrote to the Department of Communities and Local Government with the same recommendations. Social housing providers should be encouraged to consider the retrofitting of sprinklers in existing high-rise buildings in excess of 30 metres height. I can't, I can't comment on the question. One of the successive housing ministers who sat on these recommendations was Gavin Barwell, now Theresa May's chief of staff. Mr Barwell had been looking into the issue, but further meetings to discuss it had been delayed by the general election. He declined to speak to us. This is one of many impromptu memorial sites that have now sprung up in the shadow of Grenfell Tower. It's not a space for recrimination, but rather a place for friends and families to mourn, and for total strangers to pay their respects and express their condolences. This fire incident is something that has really touched everybody, any soul should be touched by this. Just to support, just, just to feel, just to support people. Just, I don't understand it. Just to try to make sense of it. Despite the grim news that 58 people are confirmed dead with more fatalities expected, there still are those who refuse to give up hope. Sorry, sir, can we give you one of these posters? OK, looking for our uncle. Um, numbers on there. We've put up some posters as well, so if you hear or see anything, just let us know. That would be great. Karim Mozilli and his family have not given up on the search for their uncle, who they last heard from in a phone call at 3am on the morning of the fire. Karim says with a lack of official information, he has turned to social media. There he's found a video of his uncle telling a young girl not to cry while trapped in the fire-engulfed building. We recognise his voice, we recognise his voice and um, it, 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 it seems as if he'd gone over to hers knowing that she was there with her kids and they probably couldn't get out just like him. And um, in the video, she snapchatted. Um, she can see the flames and the smoke coming up towards them from the outside. And the, 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 the child is basically saying, um, I'm scared, uh, I don't, I, no, she said, this makes me cry, it makes me upset, I don't want to, I don't want to, um, I don't want to see this. And he says, he says to her, don't worry, uh, sorry, don't cry, it's going to be okay. 
he was he was you know great with great with great with us when we were younger. You know that's what. He used to put me to bed when I was a little girl. You know that he, he was like my father figure after my dad died. He supported me so much. He's my best friend. Does it bring you comfort knowing that he's there with other people? If, oh, this, yes. if this is him? Yeah, I, I just I, I hope he wasn't alone. And it does. It, I mean, you know, for me, if again, this is not 100 percent but we're we're pretty sure. Uh, you know, he's he's rather than being scared and panicking, just like the lady was. You know, she can tell from the tone of her voice she's scared, she's panicking, she's praying. The child is is quite upset, but again, not sort of in a panic stage, and he's just comforting the child. You know, don't that's worry, him. it's going to be okay. Don't cry, and you know, that's, that's Uncle Richard. Other survivors have come forward with stories of how they lost loved ones during their escape. I opened the door. Black smoke came like that to our faces. I said, ah, uh -huh, that's a different thing. Okay, so I grabbed her from her hand and told her to do like me. Part of the dressing gown, put it away on my nose, so to filter the air. It takes about, for each floor, at least something like 20 minutes or something like that, you know, because it's packed and people fighting for their life. That the 16th floor looked behind me, she's there, okay, fine. And then continued, didn't look behind me. And even I, if I look behind me, that smoke, the black smoke, okay, there are lights and so that black smoke, sometimes you don't see it clear. We reached 15th floor. I looked back, we didn't see her. And for Ahmed Shalit, who we first spoke to on Wednesday morning, the tragic confirmation that five members of his family are dead. The story of this fire of London has been one of tragedy and trauma, heartbreak and heroism, but it's far from over. The miserable task of identifying those who remain in the tower will take many months. And for the victims and the relatives, the day of judgment for those who are ultimately responsible cannot come too soon. <laughs>